In this section, we'll discuss the variables that go into defining the Hamiltonian. Before we dive into the variables that define the Hamiltonian, let's first review some important results uh, from a previous section. This, a lot of this uh, discussion is going to come from section 7.8 uh, earlier in the book. Recall that uh, the Lagrangian is defined so that it's a, a function of the generalized position variables qi and the generalized momenta qi dot. And there can also be time dependence, although we'll, we'll consider a case where there is no time dependence. And one question you might ask is, well, how does the Lagrangian change with time? Now, the Lagrangian can change with time in two ways. There can be a change uh, in time due to change in uh, due to qi and qi dot. Those can change in time in such a way as to give you changes uh, to the Lagrangian. But you can also have an explicit dependence uh, of the Lagrangian on time. So if t actually appears in the equation for the Lagrangian, uh, you'll have this second term. Let's look at what this first term actually works out to be. Okay, so here we are working out the time derivative, the full time derivative of the Lagrangian. This is going to be equal to, uh, first, the sum over all coordinates i, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, coordinate qi times the time derivative of qi. Next term, of course, because the Lagrangian depends not just on q, but q, uh, q dot, we have this expression, a sum over i, partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized uh, velocity qi dot times d qi dot dt. And then, as I said already, there can be an explicit time dependence. Well, we know that by definition, uh, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to the generalized velocity, qi dots, that's defined to be the generalized momentum, pi. And the Euler-Lagrange equation tells us that the qi partial derivative of the Lagrangian, that's just equal to the total time derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to qi dot, or in other words, the time derivative of the generalized momentum i. And so we can rewrite the time derivative, the total time derivative of the Lagrangian using this equation and this equation here. Okay, and so here's our total time derivative of the Lagrangian. It's going to be equal to a sum over i, the partial of the Lagrangian with respect to qi, which we just worked out to be pi dots, times qi dot, the time derivative of q with respect, excuse me, the time derivative of qi, plus a sum over i, and this would be the partial derivative of Lagrange with respect to qi dot, which we just worked, we just explained was defined as the generalized momentum for the coordinate qi, and that's multiplied by qi double, uh, double dot, so two time derivatives of qi, so that's going to be this right here, two time derivatives, and then we have any explicit dependence of the Lagrangian on time. We have uh, sums over i for both of these, so we can combine the sum over i so that it looks like this. pi dot, qi dot, plus pi, qi, let's try that again, qi dot, plus any explicit time dependence. Now it seems pretty clear that you could rewrite this expression in here, you can rewrite it as the 
the time derivative of the sum P I Q I dot. And you can work out, you can show that indeed if you were to apply this time derivative across this sum, you would work out this exact same expression. And so the total time derivative of the Lagrangian is equal to the total time derivative of the sum over all the coordinates i, <coughs> pi, qi dot, plus the explicit time dependence. Now, if there's no explicit time dependence for the Lagrangian, which very often there is not, we see that the time derivative of the Lagrangian is just equal to the time derivative of this expression right here. And so that means that any change in the Lagrangian with respect to time has to be due to a change in this sum over time. Now we can uh, pull uh, this time derivative over here on the left side, put it on the right side, and we get that 0 is equal to the time derivative of this sum dot minus the Lagrangian. Now this, this expression in, inside the parentheses has a special name. It is, in fact, the Hamiltonian. And what this equation tells us is that uh, if there is no explicit time dependence of the Lagrangian, then the Hamiltonian is a conserved quantity. In other words, the generalized momenta and velocities will together evolve in such a way as to conserve this expression in here. Now, now it turns out that for many physical systems that we might be interested in studying, the Hamiltonian works out to just be the total energy of the system. Let's look at how that works out. Okay, so here's the definition of the Hamiltonian again. Uh, and now I won't spend too much time on this point, um, but for many uh, systems, you can show that uh, the Hamiltonian represents the total uh, energy of the system, and so the conservation of the Hamiltonian with time, that just expresses the conservation of energy of the system. It is important, however, to keep in mind that the Hamiltonian is defined in this way, and so it doesn't always work out to be the total energy of the system, and there are certain uh, interesting systems where it doesn't actually uh, represent the total energy of the system. Okay, So let's just take a very specific example to show how this, this kind of works out in principle. If, for example, we had a, a just a, a point particle uh, in motion along one dimension, um, it might have a mass m, and uh, its generalized velocity, the only one we need to worry about, that's going to be x dot, say. The momentum, the, con the, co the cor uh, corresponding momentum for this coordinate then will, of course, be just m x dot. And you can see then that this sum over i, pi, qi dot, that's going to work out to be m x dot times x dot. And so this is, of course, just twice the kinetic energy for the system. So remember, that's twice 1 half m x dot squared. Okay. And so for this case, if we have a, a conser any conservative forces acting in the system, you can see that the Hamiltonian is going to be equal to uh, 2 times the kinetic energy minus the Lagrangian, which is, of course, the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. And so in this case, you can see that uh, the Hamiltonian just works out to be the kinetic plus the potential energy. Now this is a, ve a specific example. This is not a proof uh, that the Hamiltonian works out to be T plus U. Um, but you can walk through uh, section 7.8 in the book and show uh, more generally 
how this relationship works out between the Hamiltonian and the total energy. But for now, this will suffice for our discussion of section uh, 13.1. So this definition for the Hamiltonian actually represents something called the Legendre transform. And what it does is it changes uh, from one function uh, of, of a certain set of variables into a, a function of another set of variables. You might have seen uh, such transformations in, the, uh, in the thermodynamics. So let's explore exactly how the Hamiltonian will change as a result of the change in different variables. And what we'll find is uh, the Hamiltonian will only change as a result of small changes to the generalized momentum, pi, and the generalized coordinate, qi, and will not have this sort of first order uh, dependence on the, uh, the generalized velocity, qi dot. Okay, so first let's take a small change in the Hamiltonian. So we ask, um, if there was a small change in the Hamiltonian, what does it do to? How would, how would this Hamiltonian change uh, at the first order? And so what we find, of course, is we get, uh, we're going to apply this differential inside the sum here, and we find that we get uh, dpi times qi dot plus pi dqi dot. And so what, it's important to keep in mind what this uh, expression here represents. This means that... Uh, PI can have a small change, and the, a small change in PI will contribute to a small change in the Hamiltonian by multiplying a small change in PI by QI dot, whatever it happens to be at some instant in time, plus any small change in the generalized velocity, QI dot, times the generalized momentum. That can also contribute to changes in the Hamiltonian. Okay. Then, of course, we have to work out uh, the dif uh, differential of the Lagrangian, Remember, the Lagrangian depends on qi and qi dot, and so uh, changes in Lagrangian look like this. So there's the qi dependence, dqi, and of course we have to do a sum over all i's here, because we've got all these variables to deal with. So there's a big minus on the front here, and you get plus partial of Lagrangian with respect to qi dot, dqi dot. Now remember, this is defined to be the generalized momentum. Through the Euler-Lagrange equation, this is the time derivative of the generalized momentum. Uh, there's a minus sign up here, right? And so this term right here is going to cancel with this term right here. And so what we're left with is any small change in the Hamiltonian is equal to a sum over i uh, qi dot dpi minus pi dot dq. And so what this says is changes to the Hamiltonian can be due only to changes in the generalized momentum or changes in the generalized coordinate. And so there's no explicit dependence on the generalized velocity anymore. And so we've done this coordinate transformation uh, so that we go from a dependence on q qi and qi dot to now a dependence on pi and qi. And the book makes a point of saying that this transition from one set of variables to the other, uh, when we use qi and qi dot, we're expressing uh, the dynamics of our system in what the book calls uh, configuration space. So these are the two variables. These are essentially the x and y axes uh, in our uh, dynamical system. But if we transfer over to this uh, pi qi dependence, now we're going to express the dynamics of our system in what's called phase space. Phase space. Uh, the distinction between these two uh, is not hugely important, and unfortunately, at the level that we're going to treat Hamiltonian mechanics here, uh, we're not going to be able to deal with sort of the intricacies and benefits of using phase space over configuration space. But I just want to make sure that you've heard uh, those expressions 
so that you, when you come back to this topic uh, at a later date, you'll understand uh, what they refer to.